Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, we'll just wait another couple of minutes until our uh, on site moderators uh, give us the green light to commence. Morning, Ella. Good morning, Celine. Nice to see you again. Hello, Taj. Hi, Taj. Hi. How are you? Hi. Good. Hello, test. Hello, can you hear me? It's Matt in the room. Okay, I think they can. Awesome. Room. So excited to kick off. Um, thanks everyone for coming to um, this session on harmonizing online safety regulation. Uh, my name's Matt. Uh, I work at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, leading their work around digital governance and rights. Um, and I'll be moderating today. So before we kick off, um, I'd like to pass to Ella, who's online, who works at the Australian eSafety Commission for a brief overview on the new uh, online safety regulators network that they have been involved in. Thanks so much, Matt. Just checking people can hear me loud and clear. Yep, you're good. Wonderful. Um, well, thanks everybody for, for joining this session, both online and in person. 
Um, I truly wish that I was able to join you there in, in Addis, but uh, alas, um, I'll have to settle for uh, beaming in from Melbourne. Uh, my name is Ella Seri and I head up international engagement at Australia's eSafety Commissioner, uh, our national online safety regulator. Uh, so today you will hear from some of the first movers and shakers uh, in online safety regulation. Um, and it's a special session too, uh, as just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we joined together to, learn, to launch the world first global online safety regulators network at the Family Online Safety Institute conference uh, in Washington, DC. Um, so we're very pleased to be able to talk to you a little bit about the Global Online Safety Regulators Network, what it means for us as, um, uh, as organisations, um, but also as part of uh, a global uh, community working together to, um, to keep uh, everyone safer online. Um, I will be your online moderator. Um, so please feel free to leave questions and comments in the, the chat box. Um, I'm also joined by our online panellists as well. Um, we have Julie Iman Grant, eSafety Commissioner of Australia, Celine Craig, CEO of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. Um, I believe we have Kevin Backhurst joining shortly, uh, who is the Group Director of Broadcasting and Online Content uh, at the UK regulator Ofcom, and Tajeshwari Devi, a Senior Officer at the Online Safety Commission in Fiji. Um, so I guess without further ado, I'll hand back over to you, Matt, um, in the room to, to kick us off for the discussion. Awesome. Uh, thanks for that intro. So keen to get um, stuck in. Um, whilst we wait for Kevin, I'd love to hear from our panelists around how in each of your jurisdictions, what are some of the key focuses you have within your online safety regimes and what kind of trends are you seeing emerge uh, over the time that you've uh, been stewarding that regime? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to start because we've been stewarding for about seven years here. Um, I, I, I guess when um, you're, you're the first um, online harms regulator on the scene, you kind of have to write the playbook as you go along. And we, we started small. Um, we were actually created um, out of a, a tragedy, um, a, a very well-known um, TV presenter in Australia who had struggled with mental health issues, had um, been brutally trolled on Twitter mostly, um, had a nervous breakdown, came back on, uh, was told an, a range of horrible things and she tragically ended up taking her life. And this was when I was um, applying to be one of Twitter's first um, representatives in Australia back in 2014. It was referred to as the Twitter suicide and it kicked off a huge petition uh, to government at the time. And the citizens basically said, you know, you need to get in involved and um, regulate people who are being bullied online. You know, people are losing their lives. Uh, but what the government decided to do at the time was to start um, with the Children's eSafety Commissioner. So took an online content scheme that we'd had in place for almost um, 18 years. And as a result of having those strong fundamental laws, very literal, little illegal uh, online content is hosted in Australia. So almost everything that we're dealing with is hosted overseas. And then we created a um, an youth-based cyberbullying scheme. And we were set up as a safety net. We're not proactively monitoring the internet for harm. Um, we all It also requires a young person who is seriously harassed, uh, intimidated, humiliated, or threatened to report to the on, uh, online platform where the abuse is happening first. And if it doesn't come down, then we save as, serve as that safety net. Now, that's appropriate because that's the most expeditious way to get it down. And we know with all forms of online harm, the more quickly you can get that down, um, the better. And we resolve um, the vast majority uh, of cases that reach that legislative threshold. Um, every time someone reports to us, it triggers an investigation. It's not like we're just putting our finger up in the air going, oh, we don't like this comment. There, There is a legislative threshold. 
Um, and uh, but but we we've solved about eighty eight percent of those uh, cyberbullying cases. Uh, informally over time, um, but we do have powers to um, issue end user notices to perpetrators uh, to find platforms or perpetrators. And then gradually over time, we had a range of different functions um, and programs layered on from an image-based abuse scheme where we have about a 90% success rate in terms of getting content taken down. Um, traditionally, image-based abuse has been a very gendered um, form of online abuse. Um, it used to be about 70% women and girls, um, but we've seen a surge of um, criminally backed sexual extortion, um, which has seen almost almost 70% of our image-based abuse reports are now sexual extortion. And the uh, scales have tipped. Um, the vast majority of reports are from uh, young, young boys between, young men between 18 and 24 and, um, and younger. So, um, you know, we, we've got powers around uh, abhorrent violent material and now serious adult cyber abuse. And now we have uh, also some systemic reforms around um, transparency and accountability, the basic online safety expectations, as well as mandatory industry codes and the first set of codes um, that are that are owned by industry um, um, are dealing with um, child sexual abuse material and uh, TVEC, um, terrorist and violent extremist content online. So all of those protections are bolstered by prevention on the front end and what we call proactive change on the other end to minimize the threat surface for the future. So th through initiatives like safety by design and then looking at future tech trends. So that's that's where, where, where we are. Um, one of the interesting discussions I think is, is countries decide what their regulatory schemes should look like is really um, should they be doing large systemic um, reforms with big fines? Um, should they be um, providing individual complaint schemes like like we do? Should they not, um, or should they do both? What I would argue is that um, we're actually able. We were we've been able to help thousands and thousands of people get down um, very harmful and traumatizing content. Um, and to remediate that harm. So we see the impact that we're having every day. Um, but it also gives us a very rich evidence base to show us precisely where the platforms are falling down in terms of um, responding to uh, systemic abuse and other challenges. Thanks, Julie. That's really interesting that you have that uh, dual approach between individual recourse, notice and action versus the beginnings of what it seems to be a more systematic approach to platform design and accountability. I'd love to hear um, from our other panelists that I, uh, I guess a bit uh, in the stages of setting up their online safety regimes at the moment, if that um, is reflected in your approach or if there are any key differences. I'm happy to come in here, Matt, if I may. Um, so Ireland, um, I'm working with the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland currently, we're the traditional media regulator in Ireland. Um, but for the last few years, Ireland has been preparing. Um, it's, it's a new online safety scheme. Um, we are expecting the legislation to be fully enacted um, before the end of, of this year. Um, and of course, I, I think it's important to point out that Ireland sits within the, the wider European regulatory framework and legislative framework in relation to oversight um, of, of, of digital platforms. And there's quite a, a swathe of legislation um, that's either here enacted already or, or in the pipeline. Um, so that's the, the wider uh, context for, for, for Ireland. Um, Ireland has adopted a largely, having regard to the fact that it's also the country of origin for all of Europe and effectively is regulating for some very major pieces of, of regulation for all of Europe. Um, and given the scale of content, indeed, and, and the speed of, of, of upload of content, um, Ireland has has are, has proposed and, and is proposing a systemic approach to, to, to regulation, um, albeit it has having regards to the kind of concerns that Julie was referring to there, um, where there is very often seen to, to be, um, you know, 
very significant and, and harmful pieces of content that are impacting on individuals' lives. It does provide further down the road, once the regulator is established, it does provide the potential um, for a, an individual complaints mechanism directly um, to the regulator. However, for the moment, um, it's envisaged that the harms, the online harms that have been identified in our legislation will be addressed by the regulator through an online safety code, a compliance and enforcement regime, which is to be established by the new media regulator, um, and indeed um, with all of the associated powers that will allow the regulator to enforce um, the legislation. The kind of harms that we're talking about, um, well, obviously, um, these touch on um, issues that are of tremendous fundamental concern um, and impact fundamental European values, such as, for example, um, around freedom of expression, hate speech is, is a major concern, and possibly one of the most um, important pieces is around the protection of minors. Um, Advertising is in the mix there as well. Within the Irish legislative regime, we've also um, a number a number of other specific harms identified, and it, it these concern very egregious forms of cyberbullying for um, children, not just for children, not just limited to children, um, but for adults as well. Um, also, the promotion of self harm and and suicide, and the promotion of eating disorders. Um, is also within the, the scope of the, the Irish legislation um, as it's currently as it's currently formulated. And to provide a degree of future proofing, I suppose, for, um, you know, for recognising that new trends emerge very quickly um, in the online space, um, it, it does, the, leg, the Irish legislation also allows for proposals to come from the legislature, the, sorry, the regulator to the legislature um, that would it, it allow specific new harms to be identified and within the scope of the regulatory regime uh, going forward. So I think that gives a certain element of, of, of future proofing. I will say, however, that, you know, there are other harms that are, are very much in the, the public discourse currently. Disinformation and misinformation is, is a very topical um, subject um, right throughout Europe and it is as it is in Ireland and um, gender-based violence is also a, a major concern and um, so all of these are, are, are in the mix if you like uh, both in the immediate future but potentially down the road as, as well in, in terms of um, the, the future and um, the, the types of harms that will fall within within the legislative legislative um, and regulatory regimes and um, throughout Europe and in, including Ireland. Thanks for that, Celine. Um, and uh, Tajeshwari, are you online? Do you have a perspective from Fiji? Yes, um, I'm Bula, everyone, um, from Fiji. So um, in terms of the online safety um, in Fiji, Online Safety Commission in Fiji, um, the Online Safety Act um, was enacted by the Parliament of the Republic of Fiji in 2018 and thus the um, establishment of the commission uh, uh, commenced on the 1st January, 2019. So basically the online safety uh, commission has been established for the promotion of online safety, deterrence of online uh, harmful electronic communication and for related matters. So basically we promote responsible online behavior and online safety. So it's both um, proactive and reactive, but we are more towards the proactive measures. So we also promote safe online culture. And this is the main actually objective of the uh, establishment of the commission is to promote the safe online culture and environment that addresses uh, cyber bullying, cyber stalking, internet trolling and exposure to offensive or harmful content, particularly in respect of children. Um, and once uh, once these uh, issues or matters are identified, we try and deter harm caused to the individuals by these electronic communications and provide efficient means of redress for such individuals. So um, probably those are the objectives of the commission. And, and for our Pacific country as a 
in Fiji for specifically Fiji as geographically uh, geographically remote and culturally rich in Fiji. Um, we have very diverse communities. That means uh, um, there are a lot of uh, multiracial uh, people, um, uh, citizens living here, and they come from different uh, cultural backgrounds. Um, so um, what I can say is the culture that we have here in Fiji as compared to um, um, internationally or other countries, um, it's very diverse and different people live here. They have different norms and cultures that they follow. And so um, things that go out on social media platforms actually really uh, concerns them um, in, in terms of like, for instance, I am an Indo-Fijian. And so for me, um, uh, my culture is quite different as compared to um, the Fijians living in Fiji. So it's it's very different. So we have to be, uh, that's why we, when, we, when we talk about uh, online safety in Fiji, we also talk about the local content and the local context in which uh, the contents needs to be created. So um, it's very important because at community level, the culture is very different at, at a, at a uh, city or town level, the culture is quite different. So it's very important to understand the cultural aspects of Fiji as well, considering um, the, the number of population in Fiji, it's, uh, it's quite less as compared to other countries, but online safety, as far as what we have uh, experienced in practical, uh, in terms of after the establishment of the Online Safety Act, uh, mostly, um, people wouldn't know what online safety really is and if we ask them do you know what internet is they know it's facebook it's whatsapp you know like viber so it's it's really it's really um it's really important for the people to know that internet can also mean going to google and typing what your assignments are what your work is so not only um it it lays on the Facebook and the social media platforms. So basically we are here, the commission is here to promote online safety. We also organize awareness uh, sessions and, uh, um, uh, and educational programs, including provision of the online safety materials. And this year we launched uh, online safety booklets, uh, contextualizing it with the Office of the E-Safety Commissioner. And that was a great material because it reached out to um, a lot of the schools and communities. And so there were like approx approximately 30,000 plus booklets which were distributed to the communities and schools. And it was actually contextualized in three different languages. Um, so, so Fiji has three different languages, one Indo-Fijian, um, that's Fiji Hindi, um, two Itoke, they call it in Fijian, and three, the English one. So it's really important to um, actually have the content available in their own languages. We also receive complaints in relation to um, electronic communication that causes or intends to cause harm. We assess and provide advice in relation to the uh, query that the complainant submitted to the commission. And the most important one is we try and consult and work with relevant agencies Considering um, the commission has been established um, three years back, we are still small in number with resources and materials. So Office of the E-Safety Commissioner has been really great to us in terms of our partnership because most of the work, we are not trying to replicate, but we are trying to learn and sort of adapt to what um, is happening at the E-Safety Commission and then trying to actually um, see how, how Online Safety Commission in Fiji can work accordingly. So that is how it is. And basically uh, building that this relationship is really great, actually. We learned from you too, Taj. Awesome, thanks for that. I'm unsure if awesome, um, thanks for that. I'm un Ofcom has joined, uh, so no. Um, but I wanted to pick up on something around like i guess like twitter like the musk takeover of twitter is very much in the news at the moment and we saw a lot of the a lot of meta layoffs over the last uh month or so and a big hit um in both of these companies is within trust and safety teams for these platform companies and i guess they're the 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 coal face of the kind of work that you do on the government side and so i guess my question is like, 
uh, particularly for Celine and how the more systematic reforms of the DSA will shape up. What are your thoughts around harder responsibility, harder enforced responsibilities, such as uh, mandating that there is an X percentage of workforce that has to be occupied, uh, occupying in a trust and safety role, or mandating that um, language parity has to be enforced, like things that go beyond, I guess, where the conversation is right now around transparency and um, algorithmic audits, that's just to know what's happening. The, the next step after that in a couple of years time is, well, what do we want these companies to do and how do we enforce that? And so do you see that there's this pipeline coming um, after the first few years of data we see uh, after the DSA is enforced? And what are your thoughts on greater powers uh, that governments could have? I might start with Celine and then if anyone else wants to jump in, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts too. So, and um, thank you, Matt. Yeah, look, the, look, the DSA will have a very strong enforcement framework um, coming from Europe um, and coordinated by the European Commission. And um, the, the, the new digital services board um, that will be put in place coming arising from uh, the enactment of the Digital Services Act will give a, a, a Europe-wide structure, if you like, to enforcement, particularly around the very large um, online platforms and the very large online search engines. Uh, so so that's, that it will be a very strong and coordinated framework, I would expect. I think the, 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 the regulatory framework at national level, I would expect also to, um, once established, can, can actually um, grow in terms of its ability to, um, it, well, first of all, the, the ability to enforce is there in the legislation, but I believe that the a very structured approach to compliance and enforcement will be required to give effect. So it's, it's not it's 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 not just about having an online safety code in place, but it's also around how that actually is given effect. So it may be, for example, through a structured performance um, um, setting process, um, annual compliance reviews or or cyclical compliance reviews. I, I certainly wouldn't anticipate anything um, l less than an annual cycle reviews, um, and also actions that would be required to be taken coming out of that. I think regulators are likely to expect, and I would expect that in Ireland, the regulator will want to see performance improvement year on year with very, you know, very focused um, performance objectives set from, 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 from one period to the next with built-in re re reviews independently, verified reviews. Um, and that is in addition to all of the other regulatory um, tools, if you like, that are, are there, such around risk assessments. And all of these pieces need to, to link up together. Once the risks have been identified, that has to feed in to performance objective setting. Um, and, and that whole process of review so that year on year we can expect better performance. Um, obviously, that needs to be matched with, you know, a strong enforcement regime where um, there have been previous breaches of the legislation or where, where an online platform, for example, is not complying with the, the, the rules that are set in online codes or within the legislation. So that's broadly how I would envisage it. I think there's been, you know, there's been a lot of experience in Europe, certainly around sort of voluntary um, monitoring and, and, and compliance with voluntary codes that, quite frankly, have not you know that that voluntary approach has not actually worked um, to the to the, the to the type of standard that regulation would expect. So I do believe that it does require strong regulation, and I believe that Europe will follow a strong compliance approach um, and enforcement approach where rules are you know not being observed or where you know there isn't that engagement for platforms in relation to compliance with the legislation. It, Matt, if you don't mind me weighing in, um, you know, I, I, I do think we, again, have to look at multiple approaches. And I don't know if you meant to be um, maybe not controversial, but uh, 
I don't I don't know that quotas or requiring certain portions of people to be part of the um, trust and safety teams, for instance, will work. And and I say that based on the fact that um, most of these companies have a very um, complex um, operating rhythm and system. So uh, you'll recall that when the first culling happened at Twitter, um, e Elon Musk said, oh, it's only 15% of trust and safety. Well, I, I sat on the um, public policy and philanthropy team and that team was obliterated, 50% were gone. And the people that sat, sat in public policy were the people that sit in, in the countries and engage with governments. Whereas the the trust and safety teams were, you know, behind the scenes responding to reports, but you need all of that. You know, the responsible AI, the ethical AI teams were um, were also obliterated. And unfortunately, in my 22 years of experience in in the tech sector, safety's always kind of been an afterthought. Uh, I recall, um, you know, putting Microsoft's first trust and safety strategy together, and I was referred to as a cost center. Um, and I tried to bring safety by design um, to the company probably 12 years ago because I was sitting in product reviews and we were looking for security vulnerabilities and uh, potential privacy breaches, um, but we weren't looking for personal harms. So I think we've now reached a tipping point now that all these governments are, are saying, hey, we've got to draw the line somewhere. And I, again, I think just to bring it back to the whole idea of the regulatory network, we're all going to take slightly different uh, approaches. There are going to be different issues that are going to be important to our government um, uh, of the day. But there are some com common themes that are really emerging. And one of them is around safety by design, like fundamentally, you know, you're not allowed if you if you um, you know you're a car manufacturer, um, for, you know for the um, you know I'm thinking about the Chevy Corvair and the Pinto. Um, if you're re rear ended and that blows up, you're not allowed to do that. You now embed seatbelts. You Im embed um, anti lock brakes, and we almost take that for granted. But that actually had to be legislated almost 55 years ago. Um, but you know you you're not allowed to you know make food and make people sick or have toys that blow up in kids' faces. But we've had this technological exceptionalism that have, ex have existed. We're pretty much dependent on technology, but there haven't been any of these rules of the ro road or requirements. So the fundamental is you need to be doing the risk assessments up front, understanding what could go wrong and build the protections in at the front end. I think that's a pretty cons consistent theme. Now, different countries will be taking different approaches. We've taken a, a cooperative soft power approach in a co collaborative approach in the first instance. Um, and we've developed risk assessment tools as an enablement um, mechanism so that these companies can comply with our um, upcoming codes and our basic online safety expectations. But um, as Celine said, you know, other, other countries are gonna take um, you know, much more blunt force approaches or much more significant approaches in terms of the quantums of fines. What I think we do need to ask ourselves though is how, how prescriptive do we need, need to be and how long will it actually take for some of these longer systemic reforms to actually replicate through the system? Um, and what I suspect we'll see here is that we're all gonna have a bunch of different tools that will probably work really well together depending on, uh, on what the platform is or the problem is we're trying to, to solve collectively for the good of all of the world's citizens. Thanks, Julie. Yes, I'm, I'm only here to ask controversial questions, so get ready for some. Um, I know that Kevin is, has joined us now and obviously the UK is in the midst of passing their online safety legislation and Ofcom um, as the regulator has really uh, ramped up their capacity to be, to be able to enforce that legislation. Um, I'd love to hear your uh, quick thoughts uh, on that whole approach and where you see that heading for the UK before I uh, jump back out to questions for the panel. Sure. Yeah. Hi, Matt. Um, sorry I'm late. I got locked out by Zoom. Um, um, yeah, so it's quite good timing for us because, um, you know, the sort of quite long delayed UK uh, online safety um, bill um, was formally reintroduced to Parliament this week. Um, 
uh, and now should move through Parliament. Um, there have been some slight changes to it. Um, in terms of your question, you know, Ofcom, um, first of all, we we have, uh, you know, we've been quite lucky in a way because the government here has given us funding for the last couple of years to enable us to build up preparations and to recruit um, teams with specialist knowledge and industry knowledge. So, um, you know, uh, as an organization, we've built up uh, approximately 250 people in the team so far to help us develop our regulatory approach, um, which includes people from industry and from NGOs and so on. Um, so, you know, we are um, really ready to go and primed to go um, as soon as Parliament actually uh, passes the bill and we are formally given the powers, um, which probably be uh, sort of spring next year and we'll go out to consult. Um, you know, and a really important part of what we're doing, um, and I'll try and keep it brief because you said make it quick, um, is uh, is this uh, international collaboration, you know, and we're very lucky to be working with Julie and Celine and um, with our Fijian colleagues as well um, on launching this network. And, you know, we are, are ambitious to expand the network, um, you know, quite soon um, because we do, do think a global approach, um, as Julie touched on there, is... Uh, you know, is by far the most effective way, um, A, to regulate, but B, also to try and align what we can in the regime so that the demands on platforms are aligned as far as is possible. Um, thanks for that, Kevin. Yeah, you set me up really well. I'm really keen to hear all your perspectives on uh, international collaboration. I think it's quite interesting that within online safety, you really have the full spectrum of what is, I think, quite easy, easy to drive consensus on, such as like CSAM and terrorist content, all the way to stuff that is maybe one of the thorniest issues in, in tech policy, which is like, what is disinformation? What is polarization? Uh, and so I guess um, the four of you have started this really incredible international network. What are your plans on actually embedding consensus in these issues that are maybe a bit more on the thorny side uh, is that for me first um, um, yeah, I can yeah. I can take it first if you like yeah go yeah. first and anyone who's uh, wants to pitch in go for it after last in gets oh, yeah. the hardest questions <laughs> well that'll be you Julia that's great so you can answer this <laughs> um, um, look I think Matt the there are, as, as you rightly say, I think there are some areas that we've already discussed where we're very aligned on our approach and the prioritization such as um, CSAM and such as, you know, really um, dreadful illegal content, terrorist content and so on. And, uh, you know, clearly those are areas that all the regimes are, are will focus on in one way or another, although the approaches may be different as Julia touched, as Julie touched on earlier on. Um, you know, but this is early days for the network, so we're going to set out a you know a work program, um, you know, to see exactly what is the most valuable thing to share early on. I mean, the UK's regime is very much now focused on um, one illegal content, so CSAM and terrorist content, and two protection of children. Um, the legal but harmful so-called part of the bill has been slightly changed; it's still there, but it's. Um, it's more focused on what the platforms now put in their terms and conditions uh, as it comes back into Parliament. So, you know, I'm sure we'll be prioritising the worst harms and seeing where we can make the, the greatest difference and align in, in the best way we can as, as global regulators, as we take up our various powers. But I'll hand over to the others for other perspectives and uh, to answer the more difficult questions. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess, um, I mean, we have sort of thought about, um, you know, what do other like-minded independent regulators look like? And is it a big, big D de democracy or a little D democracy? Um, whenever you, you go into the realm of what might be considered um, censorship, um, things are going to get thorny. And, and there were a few fundamental principles that we all agreed upon in terms of um, respect for human rights and uh, freedom of expression. Um, you know, and our, our, our view is, um, as we observed over time, that, um, you know, we have a legislative threshold that's relatively high, but what we've observed over time is that misogynistic, uh, racist, 
uh, homophobic, um, any kind of targeted um, online abuse that is desi designed or intended to cause serious harm um, is also intended to silence. So if you let, um, you know, targeted online harm um, go un untouched, that does have a direct impact on um, freedom of expression. But um, as you've seen some of the debates play out in the United States, for instance, a lot of the debate is around uh, either the First Amendment or Section 230, but then you've got you've got bills like the Texas bill, um, and even some of the debate around uh, Section 230 was about whether or not conservative voices were um, were silenced vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, say more liberal voices, and so you know the the tenor and tone can really change um, um, and become more political when you. Um, I guess you add value judgments to it and you're not looking at, um, you're not viewing this in, in, in the context of, of harm and uh, alleviating harm. And we're all going to define that slightly differently, I, I, I expect. Um, Matt, am I coming yes, up? please. Yeah, I think, you know, I think both Kevin and Julie there have flagged, you know, where the, the commonality is between us uh, in terms of some of these fundamental values. Uh, I think when you're working off a basic set of principles, um, certainly in my own experience as a as a regulator in, in Europe, we have found while, you know, that while very often local law or national law, um, you know, can be very different from one member state to another, for example, there's still enormous commonality in, in some of the, um, the regulatory tools that are used, if you like, to, to, to give effect um, to, to the objectives of, of, of media regulation. Um, so I think, you know, our experience certainly in Ireland has been has has really been around the kind of value that collaboration in this space can can bring we can learn of each other in terms of um prioritization in terms of the types of regulatory tools that are used there's enormous amount to be gained from the sharing for example of research um is is hugely valuable as well so i think there's lots of ways in which um we can we can benefit um, from this type of collaboration um, particularly, as I said, when you're working off some very commonly agreed principles. Um, for us, it, the experience has always been extremely valuable to collaborate. Um, and I, I think, you know, we are seeing common theme in terms of online regulation around things like risk, the, under, the requirement to undertake risk assessments, the, you know, the formulation of online safety codes and the experience in 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 preparing these and in implementing them and in reviewing them, all of that gives us a huge um, amount of commonality, um, regardless of, of some of the, the, perhaps the specific details that can sometimes be required um, at a national or, or local level. Um, but there's still a huge amount of common ground, I would believe, um, that, that really um, has propelled us, I suppose, or uh, impelled us to, to, to join together and um, to share our experiences and, and best practices. Thanks. Um, Taj, did you have any um, thoughts before we move on to questions? Yeah, so um, practically um, from Fiji's perspective, um, I just jumped to a case study, for instance. Um, um, Fiji, um, again, Fiji is, a, is low in population and um, um, the regulation that has been really, um, we are in the regular um, commission has been established from the past three years. Um, we, um, in terms of receiving uh, reports uh, from individuals in Fiji, um, we can say that there are sometimes um, individuals who are reporting at the commission um, in Fiji. Um, so the complainant is uh, in Fiji or the complainant is um, us, a Fiji citizen, but is in um, overseas or the perpetrator is in overseas or the perpetrator is here in Fiji. So both ways um it actually becomes a little difficult for us to work in those cases because really uh there aren't um such regulations in other countries we we understand australia does have so it makes our work quite easy um but if it's like in other countries it it is like um, um 
for us to approach a, a Fiji police force whom we are really closely working with. And um, so they deal with Interpol in, in order to connect to those cross-border cases. So I'm, I'm really actually, um, we are really actually excited about this Global Online Safety Regulators Network because uh, for a Pacific country as geographically um, remote and culturally rich as Fiji, the Global Online Safety Regulators Network actually offers a great opportunity uh, for the members to share information, discuss and address challenges such as uh, cross-border complaints and acknowledging cultural diversity. Um, collaboration with the, our international stakeholders is actually crucial because uh, it is uh, allowing us to achieve uh, the online safety space that does not have any boundaries and we are stronger together than apart. Yeah, that was a great sentiment to to lead into questions. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I want to open to the room if anyone has any questions or if um, Ella, there's any online. I see there's a couple here, so I might start here and Ella, if you want to corral the online audience. Good morning, thank you all. Uh, my name is Bia, I come from Brazil, and congrats for the launch of the network. I would like to know if you have already any regulator from Latin America working with you or being part of the network. And for all of you, if you could comment a little bit the idea of the risk assessment from the DSA. Uh, if you think that it might work, since some of you has already, have already mentioned that uh, the uh, voluntary approach from the platforms has not been working so far, but I think that uh, even in the DSA, in the European and DSA, you have, there, there is this idea of that the, the risk assessment is something that the platforms are going to uh, be uh, responsible for. So uh, if you are uh, hoping that it's going to work uh, now and because we are from Brazil, we are um, looking very carefully to the, this new uh, legislation, the DSA and the DMA in Europe as well, because like in other uh, experience, we, we have a very good opportunity to take advantage from the European re uh, legislation to foster national re uh, legislation in Brazil as well. So I would like to hear a little bit from you from this perspective, from the risk assessment that you think that it might work right now, and also how we could collaborate from, with you from Latin America. Thank you very much. Well, I would just say that, I mean, the reason that we would, we, we wanted to develop risk assessments is, is so that, again, companies are being mindful that their technologies, their policies and the processes um, are being built in ways that don't harm people or, if, and, and, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that no one started a not many people would have started a tech company with the the idea of um, hurting. It always starts with good ideas and good intentions. Um, but we also know that whenever you have humans in the mix um, uh, and you can't always moderate human behavior or human malfeasance, and, and, and that's, that's what the result is. I was going to say, I am not aware um, of any independent uh, regulators or statutory authorities in, in Central or Latin um, America. Um, in my, you know, my previous roles in the tech sector, I've definitely worked across Latin America um, with data protection authorities. And, and you know, my op observation is um, you know, many countries in Latin America, in particular South, and South America, do tend to follow that European tradition um, of the, the data protection authority. Um, but that's something uh, to look into um, in, in terms of how we might try and expand um, our reach. I mean, we, we haven't talked about this, but um, you know, over time we might look at you know, model laws or doing case studies around what has been effective with risk assessments or specific regulatory tools or um, or in industry codes, um, and I and I think in some ways, um, companies will 
appreciate that. Industry will appreciate that. They don't want to be negotiating, you know, 190 wildly different sets of codes that they then have to, to, to comply with. Can I, can I add to that, if that's all right, Julie um, yeah. and Matt? Um, just on the risk assessments, I mean, also, you know, the UK's legislation has risk assessments at the heart of it as well. So companies will be required to do risk assessments on uh, illegal harm. Um, uh, and we'll look at those and see if those are satisfactory. And Ofcom in the UK is also required to do an overall risk assessment to identify the issues that, that the larger companies should be looking at. This is the... Um, is the category one with the biggest companies. Um, just on the other part of the question, to pick up on Julie's point um, and the question about, you know, Latin American members. I mean, as as Judy's mentioned already, you know, we we sort of agreed, you know, membership um, of this um, network, global network, um, is based on the fact that it's independent regulators that that have that are aligned on um, commitment to freedom of expression and human rights and so on. Um, However, I think you know one of the areas we've also discussed is, um, apart from the core membership, is about convening um, other authorities and interested parties and NGOs and so on. So, we will definitely try and find other ways um, to engage with uh, those people, both in Latin America and also, you know, we're ambitious across Europe as well to to uh, bring on board other like-minded regulators, but find other ways of engaging with. Other authorities who won't necessarily kind of meet that kind of core criteria, if you like. Matt, if I may come in here just on, on the subject of risk assessments. I, I think my colleagues Julian and Kevin have, have covered issue around participation in the network and, and suffice to say that it's uh, we're not going to be standing still um, in, in, in relation to its, its current formulation. Uh, just in relation to the, the issue of risk assessments under the DSA, uh, this is, is work in progress in relation to the format or if I understood the question correctly, it was around the structure that would be given to that. Obviously, I, I think it's, it's, it's also something which is facilitated in the Irish legislation. Um, obviously, the, the, the risk assessment under the DSA will have to be tailored to, to the breadth of, of issues that are with the scope of, of the DSA. And um, the, these potentially go, they, they go beyond um, media content as such. There's, there's other um, illegal um, harms that, that potentially fall within the scope of the DSA. Uh, obviously, our focus in, in Ireland would be very much on the you know the, the 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 giving putting a framework around the legislative provisions that will allow um a thorough assessment of of the risks um as, as they're presented as i said earlier i think what will also be very very key in the risk assessment will be to look to look at product design and to see where the risks might have been mitigated in the first instance, but also to look at a platform's policies, practices and procedures in terms of how they address that, um, how they mitigate the risk and to look at ways and try to find ways of, of minimizing the risk to, to a much greater extent. So I think there's a, there's a broad framework there that can be developed and evolved, but can apply perhaps um, you know, to, to address local concerns or local, but more specific local or national needs. Um, but as I said, the, the, the risk assessment template um, for the DSA is, is, has yet, it hasn't obviously been given full effect at this stage, but I would expect that that will be a key priority um, at, at the European level um, in 2023. Um, thank you. Uh, Malcolm Hutton for London Internet Exchange. Um, since the topic of this uh, session is about harmonising the uh, treatment of online harms and what we've been introduced to um, is the regulator to regulator network here, um, which I think is, if I understand correctly, is about learning from each other, uh, le regulators learning from each other and developing, if not best practices, maybe that's a bit strong, but at least learning opportunities from what each other are doing. I wondered if that just works in one direction. Um, the regulation of um, 
allegedly harmful content is always a balance that is struck within any given um, country when they pass legislation in this area um, between concerns about what should not be allowed and concerns about um, protecting freedom of expression and the, and the right to participate online and to receive information online. But that balance is often struck and mostly struck before the legislation is passed. So, for example, the, in the UK context, for example, the, uh, if we've been talking a couple of weeks ago, um, Ofcom would have been talking a lot about uh, the uh, content that's harmful to adults as being one of the major pillars of um, the reg legislation that's coming. Now it's not going to be because the government's been persuaded that that's going too far against um, uh, against freedom of expression and has taken a big chunk out of that out of the bill. So if that regulator to regulator contact had happened two weeks ago, Ofcom would, I would expect, it would have been describing how you could learn about all what we're doing on content that's harmful to adults that isn't illegal and now won't be in the same way because it's not included as a result of that change in the in the balance in the balance that was made in the legislative process in the UK so how would that have been received by the other regulators if Ofcom had been saying that and do we get a different outcome do the other regulators take up the idea of content that's um, legal but harmful to adults when Ofcom says it if it goes that if that debate goes that way in the UK two weeks ago but not spread around the world if it gets taken out of the bill before Ofcom comes and engages in this regulatory network or is there some mechanism do the regulators challenge each other in the other direction not only in what are we not doing that we could be doing to suppress harmful content but also, what are we doing that we shouldn't be doing or that should be protecting freedom of expression more? I'm only really aware of the Texas legislation as being legislation that really assesses suppression by trust and safety teams as a major harm in itself. For the most part, the legislation that I'm aware of assumes that freedom of expression ought to underpin harmful regulation but do the regulators in this network seek to fill in that gap by adding new specific things that should be done to protect that or is that just assumed again as part of the background and so the information sharing acts as a ratchet in favor of further suppression but uh, other colleagues are already talking about the geographic uh, component and the uh, fragmentation between different geographies. But we see fragmentation also inside of the same uh, single country. And uh, why? I because think we have someone who dialed in accidentally. Concrete, specific yeah. project. <laughs> trying to look for. If you want to just push the can, man. can we need so him? One example would be to protect, to block or filter, uh, filtering contents because they are violating intellectual property rights Do you want or to, uh, because they are considered illegal or, mute them or we see examples regarding gambling or many I'm other sorry, I'm not able to mute uh, um, so the, we see laws and regulations that simply say to the um, uh, internet uh, service provider or to the platform cool okay oh thank you whoever did that yeah. <laughs> Yes. Um, <laughs> um, listen, that was a long question, and I'll, I'll probably turn over mostly to Kevin. But I, I, I just want to say, I mean, he rightly he rightly points out, it's legislatures, it's parliaments, it's policymakers that create the laws, um, and you know, we certainly had the experience. I think we've been working with um, the. Um, I'm going to pronounce this terribly wrong, Celine. Um, Arictus, <laughs> we we've been working with the you know uh, Australia or sorry the um, Irish policymakers in terms of shaking shaping not because we had any particular interest in sh in shaping how Ireland um, you know developed its online safety regulation but just just to answer questions about how our operating model worked well, you know what worked what didn't so that others can learn from our mistakes and 
you know, the, the idea of a global network of reg regulators isn't new. Um, the Global Privacy Assembly was established, I believe, in 1979. Um, we're, we're almost, you know, we have so many data protection authorities or privacy commissioners around the world. We kind of don't think about the, a time when there, there, there wasn't regulation in that area in much of the world. And if you look at the IIC, which are the traditional regulators and Celine and Kevin would know um, much more about them, but they've, they've, they've been around even, even longer. So we are, we have built flexibility into the framework of the network um, so that um, we, we can have um, certain countries or governments um, that are um, interested in fit the criteria to serve as observers uh, so that they can, they can learn from us too. And, and, Sure, we may sh we may shape each other's practices. You know, I may learn from Ireland that that the way that the fundamental research they've done on changing ideas around how to mitigate self harm, for instance, um, works really well according to their evidence, and we might want to try it in in, in Australia. Um, so I can foresee a range of different scenarios when we'll be learning from each other, so that we're not reinventing the wheel. I don't think we're we're here to um, change anyone's particular way of doing things because it, for most for most of us, um, our parliaments or our Congress or our legislatures will have defined what our functions are um, and you know what what the risk tolerance is around some of these issues. Um, does anyone have a quick comment before I close? Matt, shall I just pick up on the freedom of expression thing, which is, you know, um, it's a very valid point from, made from the floor there, but um, there are different approaches. Um, you know, it is actually baked in um, to the UK uh, online safety legislation and Ofcom as the regulator also has a statutory responsibility um, to consider freedom of expression, to support freedom of expression, which we already do in our broadcasting work. Um, so, you know, it will be forefront of our minds and just on the wider point um uh about you know regulators and 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 how we're going to work if you like i think i would echo what judy just said which is it's about sharing best practice you know we're all we're, we're, we will all be bound by our um as judy said by our parliament or by um our legislature or by the iraqis in ireland but um you know, so we're not going to try and change what each other are doing. We'll align as far as we can do, but we're very aware these are going to be, you know, relatively different regimes, either in scope or in approach, whether it's, you know, systems and processes in the UK or take down in some other parts of um, uh, of the world. Uh, awesome. Thanks. Um, well, I'm an optimist at heart, and I think that international collaboration is the only way to be able to solve this. So congrats on launching uh, your network and joining us here in Addis for a really great panel. Um, I'm sure we're all looking forward to everything you guys do over the next few years as the network expands and um, get some interesting progress on this issue. So um, thanks so much for joining us and good night, good morning, good day. Thanks, thanks for making international networks sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Recording in progress.
Recording in progress.